I'm going to turn it off over to Dr. Orenstein, who is going to give us uh, kind of the big picture perspective on vaccine hesitancy and, and, and why, why this is an important thing to think about. So Dr. Orenstein. My goal today is to speak to you about vaccine hesitancy as a public health problem. I have no conflicts to disclose. Vaccines have been one of our great triumphs. Most of the vaccine preventable diseases of childhood, for example, have been reduced by more than 90%, some 99%, and the only disease, human disease ever eradicated in the world, smallpox, was eradicated through a vaccine. This is a paper published in Pediatrics by Fang Zhu Zhu uh, many years ago, and uh, it shows what the costs of averted by a program, what the program costs, and the bottom line is right here, in direct medical care costs for the program, about $3 were saved in the childhood immunization program for every dollar spent. And if you take into account indirect savings, such as parents not having to take care of, take off of work to care for an ill child, about $10 were saved for every dollar spent. Now vaccines protect in two ways. One is individual protection in which a, an active immune response is fostered through the vaccine. Your immune system acts like an army or a police force, detect the enemy, the virus, the bacteria, the germ, destroy it before it causes disease. And that's the active immunity. But vaccines protect in a second way, which I call community protection, because I think it better describes things than herd immunity. You have a transmitting case for almost all of the vaccine preventable diseases who comes in contact with a susceptible individual, shown here in red, transmits infection to that susceptible individual, and that susceptible individual becomes a transmitting case capable of infecting other susceptibles. When you have high vaccination coverage and induce high levels of immunity, you markedly reduce the chances that a transmitting case will find the susceptible, and so you break the chains of transmission. And that means you indirectly protect a lot of people. Who are these people? Persons for whom vaccine is rec not recommended, such as children who are too young for vaccination. Persons who have a legitimate medical contraindication to vaccination. And vaccine failures. No vaccine is 100% effective. All of them have some proportion, most very low, of vaccine failure. They're indirectly protected when you have high immunity in the community. Again, this is often called herd immunity. I prefer community protection because for these people here, they're indirectly protected. They're not really traditionally immune. Now what this means is we have obligations as a society to individuals because when individuals get vaccinated, for the most part, they are not just getting vaccinated for themselves, they also confer societal benefits. But it also means on the other side, individuals have obligations to society to protect not only themselves, but others in society who may even be more vulnerable to the bad aspects of a vaccine preventable disease. So what are some of the obligations? One, I think society, has an obligation to minimize barriers to access, such as cost. Number two is society has an obligation to continue to monitor safety and effectiveness of vaccines on an ongoing basis, and when appropriate, change recommendations for use. Number four, is society mandates immunization, but this is an individual obligation to society in that, for example, in schools, 
it is important to have high levels of immunization because there is a potential high force of infection because of all the contacts children have with each other. And that's an individual's obligation to society. And society has also an obligation to individuals who are injured by vaccines. And that's why we have a vaccine injury compensation program. Now, the Strategic Advising groups of, a Group of Experts on Immunization, which advises the World Health, Health Organization, has defined vaccine hesitancy as a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of vaccine and vaccine services. Vaccine hesitancy is complex and context-specific, context specific. it varies across time, place, and individual vaccines. It is influenced by factors such as complacency, I don't care, convenience, just the hassle to get it, and actually confidence in vaccine safety and effectiveness. Does hesitancy matter given, matter given most parents vaccinate their children? And the answer is yes. Yes, there are people who want to be free riders and let everybody else vaccinate and then indirectly protect their children. But what's key is to need to uniformly maintain extremely high coverage, perhaps indefinitely. And if you recall last year, 2019, we had our highest measles year since 1992. And the reason for that is we had a subpopulation, particularly in the Orthodox Jewish community, particularly in the Northeast of New York, which was enough to maintain transmission of the virus because they came in contact. So even though overall population immunity levels were high, the subpopulation was a problem. In fact, our last polio outbreak in 1979 occurred among the Amish, again, because they were subpopulations with frequent contact with, another, with one another who were susceptible. Refusal has been associated, I mentioned measles, pertussis or whooping cough, cough Mafos and formula type B, a bad cause of, of bad meningitis, chicken pox or varicella, uh, pneumococcal disease, and, and others. Vaccine hesitancy, as I said in the definition, is complex. You have most people who accept all vaccines and have high demand. Then you have an intermediate group which accepts some or delay some or refuse some. And then you have at the extreme people who refuse all. The modern anti-vaccine movement in the US started in 1982, and it was a pushed over from what was happening in the UK. And this YouTube site gives you a flavor for it. It was a program by Lee Thompson, at WRC in uh, Washington, D.C., the NBC affiliate, which was ex excerpted on the Today Show. Remember, this is before we had um, cable TV. And it showed children seizing on camera, retarded the allegation that was caused by vaccine. No explanation of how you safely, how you evacuate, evaluate safety. It started that, it started a group called Dissatisfied P together, Parents Together, which led to a barrage of lawsuits. This is now the National Vaccine Information Center. That lawsuits led to manufacturers either permanently going out of the business, vaccine shortages. On the good side, it led to a vaccine injury compensation program, and it led to more resources for ongoing vaccine safety monitoring. This is a study recently published in Pediatrics by Allison Kemp from the University of Colorado. It was a nationally representative sample of families with children, and 6.1% of them were hesitant about routinely recommended childhood vaccines, 26% with regard to influenza, which is recommended universally. 
12% strongly and 27% somewhat agreed that they had concerns about serious side effects of childhood and influenza vaccine. Thus, almost one in 15 U.S. parents at that time were hesitant uh, with regard to vaccinations. And just to recall how vaccines are looked at and what the foundation for vaccine safety is, this is uh, just shows you vaccines before licensure usually go through three phases, three phases of trials. Phase one is 20 to 100 volunteers. It's very small. It looks at the immune response, what the dose of uh, a quantity of antigen in the vaccine should be, potentially what the schedule should be, and are there any co very common serious side effects. If this goes well, it moves to phase two, which is usually several hundred volunteers, again, looking at short-term side effects and immune responses. And then the trials that are used for licensure are phase three that can uh, be in hundreds or, or thousands of volunteers. The COVID trials being planned are estimated to have about 30,000 volunteers and they actual measure safety, but they also measure actual clinical efficacy and they can detect the most common side effects and even some of the rarer ones. But then we have a system in the US for continuing to monitor safety. One is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System or VAERS. This is a passive system. It allows the vaccinee, the parent of the vaccinee, a community member or the healthcare provider to report to a system. This is more hypothesis generating because there's no control or comparison group. If you get clusters, it makes you look at, hey, this vaccine may cause adverse event A, let's look at it causally. And for that, we have several systems. The vaccine safety limit, uh, data link includes many of our large HMOs and what this does is allows you to calculate the incidence of the adverse event in vaccinees versus non-vaccinees. If it's higher in vaccinees, it will be compatible with causation. If it's equal to the incidence in vaccinees, that would be more compatible with coincidence. And remember, if 90% of people are vaccinated, 90% of the bad things that would happen after vaccination will happen in vaccinated people. And then there's a Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, or CISA, CISA, which can do special studies uh, as associated with major academic medical centers. So what are the causes of vaccine hesitance? Vaccines are a victim of their own success. Most people have never seen these diseases and so don't realize the benefits they're getting. One, a second issue is people don't understand that because event B follows event A, it doesn't mean event A caused event B. And we commonly do that. And this is one thing I think the media can help with in trying to explain coincidence versus causal. How people make decisions. Uh, we often make it on anecdotes. And the DPT vaccine roulette had these horrible anecdotes which were gut-wrenching and will influence people not looking at scientific data and other factors that are, are there with trust in government, trust in industry, and the like. This just shows you last year's measles that I talked to you about uh, earlier with the largest measles outbreak since 1992. And what you could see here is 72% were unvaccinated, only 10% were vaccine failures and 18% unknown. And again, this occurred in a, particularly in a subpopulation, which was highly unvaccinated. One of our big concerns is COVID vaccines. And what you could see here is a slide given to me by Sarah Mbehi of CDC, who presented at the uh, July uh, 29th Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices meeting and these are from a variety of studies showing you that despite all the concerns about COVID-19, only 49% overall said they would get it, and 20% said no, 
In some studies, in some racial and ethnic groups, it's even higher, such as in the African-American community. And we need to be very concerned about it, not only for these individuals, for us as a society as a whole. So what are issues impacting? I've already mentioned several times, trust in corporations and government uh, are low. The pharmaceutical industry, the belief that they will compromise anything to make money. The growing interest in natural. Natural is good. Vaccines are artificial. We need to green our vaccines. The medical model that says, rather than a doctor saying, your child ought to get this vaccine, let's talk about it. These are the benefits. These are the risks. What is your uh, uh, decision? This is a, a concern as opposed to the traditional way of the doctor saying, this is what your child ought to get. And the need at times to see more patients and less time, so the lack of time to devote to talking to people who are hesitant. The role of the media, the potential for sensationalism is a real concern. These anecdotes are very driving. And then the ability to get bad information on the internet, not just good information. And this is just from uh, almost a decade ago, a lot of parents, even those who vaccinated their children, had a number of concerns about vaccines. And I won't go through all these, you'll have the slides, but this is not a trivial issue to this day. And then the, the issue, this is from uh, a number of decade ago, decades ago, this was in California, looking at clusters of immunization showing major differences. And again, overall statewide or overall countrywide immunization coverage can be very misleading because it could conceal pockets of under immunization. What we need is high immunization in every community to minimize the risk of adverse events. So in summary, vaccine hesitancy is a problem. Vaccines are victims of their own success. Trust in government and industry can be low. People lack an understanding of how to determine whether an adverse event following vaccination is causally related or coincidentally related. And the media have an important role in addressing this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Orenstein. Um, so uh, since we have a panel of three today, um, I. Generally, I'm going to try to hold all questions until the end so we have a good long Q&A time. If you have something very quick, a very quick clarifying question, you know, um, you can raise your hand or put it in chat and we'll try to address it during that speaker. But in general, let's hold off until we get through all three speakers. And now we will turn it over to Dr. Savoy, who is going to talk about something that Dr. Orenstein mentioned, what's going on in the doctor's practice and how are they talking with their parent, uh, their patients. So Dr. Savoy. Thank you all for the opportunity um, to come and speak to you today. I wanted to really talk about um, a tale of three stories um, with my little 15 minutes of fame. Um, first, I wanted to talk about, in general, the experience of what it's like to be a family physician sort of navigating all of this. But really, not everybody who, not everybody who declines a vaccine necessarily hates vaccines. Um, and so it's a really important message that I think for us to take home. Um, and how physicians interpret and um, internalize that information makes a difference in how they approach the conversation, which makes a difference in how willing patients are to accept the recommendation that they give. Um, second, I want to talk a little bit about how um, I like to teach people to navigate the conversation. So I get the opportunity to teach both colleagues and students about um, discussing vaccines and encouraging vaccines in their practice and some things that worked and didn't. And then I wanted to throw in a third idea that sort of comes up um, about why sometimes even people who recommend vaccines don't have them available in their practice. Um, and, and a really um, very timely story about COVID and my freezer full of vaccines at the moment. So first thinking about not everyone who declines hates vaccines. So you heard this already in Dr. Ornstein's lecture, but there's a spectrum of people um, when we think about vaccine hesitancy and vaccine resistance. And just like any other bell-shaped curve, you know, on one end, there's the people who don't even think twice about it, don't even know why you're asking them. Of course they want that vaccine. And on the other end, you have the people who, even if you gave them all the money in the world, they're still not going to let you come anywhere near them with the vaccine. But the vast majority of, of patients and folks in the world don't fall in either one of those groups. They kind of fall in the middle. Um, and the way that I like to think about it is that um, 
is that some people are just fluid about vaccines so that they'll take most of the vaccines, but there may be one or two here and there that they have exception with for one reason or another, um, or they may have a particular time in their life when they're not interested in getting vaccines. And you being able to meet the patient at the space where they are at that time makes a huge difference in your ability to be able to help them make the best decision for themselves. One thing that's a bit of a challenge and that seems to come up in our, in our offices, particularly in um, in primary care sites is the silence of the masses. So that what often will happen is that you'll hear a lot about a very small number of people being incredibly vocal about their stance. And you start to believe that that small group is actually speaking for the wider group. And it turns out that the average patient in most practices doesn't really have a huge opinion about it. They got their vaccine, but they didn't necessarily feel the need to go out and shout to the world that for example, they got their flu shot today, they had no side effects, they didn't get the flu this year and they feel great. That's not really something that they feel, you know, that they need to go out and tell everybody and their grandmother. And so there's just a, sort of this silence of acceptance where people feel fine about it. They just don't feel like they need to talk about it. On the flip side, that one or two people who maybe had a bad experience or felt like there was an issue is telling everybody all the time it's getting recreated, resent out. Not unlike if you had one bad experience at a store and now all of a sudden you think the entire chain needs to be eliminated. Sometimes that seems to happen um, with the vaccine story, particularly in the social media space where it can be a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, you may have great information getting out to masses really quickly, but it can very quickly turn around the other way and be wrong information being shared widely by a lot of folks, which is a problem. When I talk to um, physicians and physicians in training about how to handle that, the first thing I tell them to do is to take their own pulse because often people um, are anxious about having to have a conversation where they feel like there's going to be a battle. So if I feel like I'm going to have to give you a recommendation and you're likely to push back on it, I'm going to come in a bit armed up thinking that I have to be ready with all the facts and all the information. And sometimes that creates an unnecessary tension in the exam room that just doesn't need to be there because for the, the vast majority of patients, they just had a question. And if you're able to answer their question, help them understand what it is that they wanted to know more about the vaccine, the rest of your visit's gonna proceed without much animosity or issue one way or the other. So you provide, clar you provide clarification, you provide reassurance and you can move on. Often I find that people will, will wanna discuss vaccine safety, but they tend to do it in a way that sounds judgmental, almost as though, um, what's common sense to you should be common sense to the person who's asking you the question. And so I don't even understand why we're having this discussion. Of course it's safe. I would never give you something that's unsafe. I don't think that the average physician is intending to come across that way. I think that from their perspective, they're really thinking about it from the public health perspective and that they're really trying to protect your life. And the reason that they're making this recommendation is because for, for them, this is common sense. They do think that you getting this vaccine would be safe and protect you and they don't want you to get the disease. They see the negative outcomes on the other side and they don't wanna see you in that space. But if you're the patient receiving that message, it may not come across to you that way, particularly if you don't have a longstanding relationship with a particular physician and so that you don't have um, sort of the experience of knowing that they care about you as a person and that they're actually trying to give you this advice for that particular reason. And I also find that sometimes we seem to um, come across as squashing curiosity so that if the person has questions, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're resistant or even necessarily completely hesitant. They just may have questions and your ability to be open to that curiosity and to help, like, help explore that with the patient, I think is incredibly important. The other side of this is taking the patient's pulse, like where are they coming from? There are a lot of pressures on patients about a lot of um, information around science and health. And it's important to know really where they're coming from and where their information is coming from. Sometimes if you jump quickly on you know, all social media is bad or you can't possibly take that advice from somebody that's not a doctor, you really come across um, in a bad way to the patient because you sound elitist. And in sounding elitist, you're discarding information that to them is incredibly important. And while we all know um, that it's quite, um, it's been um, studied multiple times and quite, quite certain that for many people, their physician is a really solid source of information for them and a go-to place for getting information, particularly their primary care physician. Um, if you are the primary care physician who can't figure out how to navigate the conversation or if I'm being sent social media posts by family members or by influencers who I happen to trust, that you automatically um, dismissing them without hearing me out or giving me a little space to be able to share what it is that um, my experience is, that you're probably not gonna get very far in that conversation. And so clarifying their sources of information, their point of view are incredibly important. When I think about navigating the conversation, um, I think a lot about the flu vaccine because this is one that comes up every single year for me. Many of my patients who will take every other vaccine under the sun fight me tooth and nail about the flu vaccine every single year. Um, there are a lot of um, published models about how to manage vaccine hesitancy that are not necessarily new, and so I won't spend a lot of time talking about them now. 
But the most important thing that I would like to share with you is that the, the shared decision-making idea is actually the most important idea. And that sometimes physicians think that by using some of these communication skills and tactics, that you're somehow trying to manipulate the patient into making a decision that's different than what they would have otherwise made. And I don't think that that has to be the case. And I certainly don't think that that's the intent. So that when I think about shared decision-making, I think about it a lot more as instead of me coming in and telling you what it is that you're gonna do, or you coming in and simply telling me what you're gonna do, that we sit down and have a conversation and I give you a recommendation about what I think that you should do based on my background and knowledge of you and the science behind what's, what's going on. And you bring me your life story and tell me what's going on with you and why you feel that particular way. And then we find a way to help you navigate the decision that you need to make at the end for your own health. Hopefully, you know, landing on the side that's gonna keep you best protected, but ultimately the person who has to be responsible for their health is the person. And so they need to be able to feel confident that the decision they made wasn't one that they got forced into, but also that they weren't making decisions with a lack of information um, or, with, or with inappropriate or inaccurate information that was helping them to make a bad decision. So shared decision-making I think is um, a key um, in how you navigate this conversation. I really believe in using personal stories. So every year we have the conversation about whether or not you can get flu from the flu vaccine. It comes up constantly in my, um, in my practice. And every year I tell them the story about how when I get my flu vaccine, because I still get my flu vaccine every year and everyone in my family gets their flu vaccine because A, I've had the flu before and it was horrible and I never want to have that again. But more importantly, I think is that I've seen people die from the flu and that to me is crazy. And I would never want to lose a family member to the flu when I didn't have to when I had a vaccine. So I talked to them about how I do get why people believe that the flu makes people feel like they get the flu. Because every year when I get the flu vaccine, my body reacts. It reacts in the sense that I get a really, really sore arm. I kind of don't feel that great for a couple of days and I kind of want to go lay down. And so the way that I navigate it is that I get my flu vaccine on Friday and that way by Monday, I'm ready to go back to work and do the things that I need to do. And I think being honest with the fact that some people do react stronger to certain vaccines or some people will have effects or side effects doesn't negate the fact that the vaccine is still super important, that I still think it ought to be gotten, and that I still think that it's important that they get this vaccine and that we can work around their life and their other needs to help them be able to receive that vaccine in a way that's going to be okay for them and their life, but also protect them for their health. And so I think using personal stories is entirely appropriate um, in the exam room. One thing that I think sometimes people get a little bit confused is this idea about paternalism and how you're giving a recommendation. And sometimes people go too far the other way where instead of telling someone um, as the physician your opinion or your recommendation, they go all the way to the other direction where they now are sort of like, well, do you want to do the vaccine? Or are you interested in the vaccine? And they make it seem very optional about getting the vaccine, which is not to say that getting a vaccine isn't optional, that people are going to force you against your will to get vaccine but your recommendation about it shouldn't be optional. And so I still give a very strong favorable recommendation for vaccines. If I'm telling you that I think you need a flu vaccine, it's a, it's a period, not a question mark. So my recommendation is that you get a vaccine or my strong recommendation for you is that you get a vaccine, period. That's the end of that sentence. Now we can have a conversation about whatever questions you may have and you may ask questions about that. And so giving a strong favorable recommendation is not being paternalistic, it's giving your recommendation. The paternalistic part is if you then didn't go to the step two, where you allowed the patient to then share their opinion and you didn't work with them to reach a resolution for how it works best for them. And then the last thing I'll share about um, this idea about navigating the conversation is this idea that um, if the person is ambivalent, somehow you failed as the physician. So that a lot of times we're taught that um, if you've done a good job as the physician, the person walks out and all their boxes are checked. All of the things that they needed to have done have been checked off and you've done a good job and that makes you good. We even reinforce that in the way that we pay people now with their quality metrics and you sort of, you get credit for things that got done, not things that I recommended, but things that get done. So you incentivize people to really be, um, to really be stuck on this idea that if the answer is not yes, then it's a complete failure of the entire conversation. And I disagree with that attitude. I really think that ambivalence is your friend, um, particularly in primary care. Because if you're saying there's a chance, it means that the next time that I see you, and there will be a next time because part of primary care is having a, a longitudinal relationship with people. So the next time I see you back again, we can, we can open up this conversation. So that if I start this conversation with me basically shutting the door on anything except the answer being yes, then I lose that ability to bring it back and have a conversation over time, make it a dialogue, and us actually being able to maybe help you move on your position or you being able to help me understand where you're coming from a little bit better. And so for me, I really like to point out that be, staying curious, being respectful leaves the door open and allows for the people who are maybe a little bit more ambivalent to come back. So anybody who sees me during flu season who says no to me the first time, 
um, knows that I'm going to ask them again because I specifically tell them, I'm not going to fight you about this today, but just know that I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to keep asking you every single time you come back from now until the time the flu season ends because I think it's really important and I want to make sure that just in case you might change your mind, we have the opportunity to give you back that vaccine again. And I find that some people who say no in the beginning actually go home and think about it and they're more willing to consider saying yes again in the future. And then I just wanted to um, sort of, the final story is just sort of thinking about this idea about why sometimes physicians might recommend a vaccine, but then still not have it available or not be able to deliver it in their practice. Um, and the way that, the best way I can describe it is that like, I really want to offer a vaccine, but who on earth can afford it? Vaccines are incredibly expensive and most of the time a practice is expected to purchase them ahead of time with the expectation that when you give them to the patient, you'll get paid back or reimbursed the cost of what you bought. The problem is that margins in primary care and family medicine are incredibly narrow. And if you're in a primary care practice that's a solo practice or a direct primary care practice, you don't have millions of dollars sitting around to invest in the freezer of, or a refrigerator full of vaccines to have just in case a patient might decide they want to have them. And if you find yourself sort of paying for that upfront cost, so the storage, the supply, all of those sorts of things, your ability to refund if something happens it's very, very unlimited in some cases. And in, and in many um, situations where people don't have the ability to buy um, vaccine in groups of people, um, they find themselves really limited by the fact that you would have to buy way more vaccine stock than they could possibly use in their practice to get a discount to make the vaccine a price that's affordable for them. And so I do think that um, it's important to think about the idea that the cost of vaccines, you know, a lot of times what people say is that they think that the government is paying the doctors so much money and that's why we push vaccines on people. And most do not seem to understand that actually vaccines in most practices is at best a break even proposition. And for some practices actually a money losing proposition. People are doing it because of the health and the uh, health of the public, not because they're making a lot of money on it. One thing that I, I think about right now is really um, appropriate right now at this moment is people are talking about primary care practices. Um, specifically, I've heard of a lot of uh, family physician practices that are struggling um, around COVID. I know that right now I have a freezer full of vaccines because normally the summertime is when we do our, uh, when we do our highest volume of physicals because people are going back to school going to college and we need to be ready and stocked and we have to order those vaccines in advance. And so I had a freezer and a refrigerator full of vaccine waiting for people to come in this summer to get their physicals done and they didn't show up. And so now we've got to figure out how to navigate a situation where you've got supply and you don't necessarily have demand. And like I say, if you're in a, in a primary care practice with a thin margin, that's not necessarily going to be a very easy thing to do. And so I think that's worth thinking about. And then the final part about that is just that as we start to have these conversations and share decision making, if you continue to pay for primary care the same way that we've always paid for it, you're never going to have time to have your physician sit down and have this conversation with you. On average, people show up with three or four problems and many with many, many more than that. And your visit's only 15 minutes long. So if you're only in the office for 15 minutes and we have to spend 20 talking about your you know, your hesitance around fill in the blank vaccine, we've lost the whole opportunity to do all the rest of your medical care, which is problematic. And so it's important to keep that sort of in the back of your mind as you're thinking about opportunities for things to consider um, for, for sort of immunization related topics. And then just sort of wrapping up with some final thoughts, things that we could talk about in the Q&A. Um, one thing I think that sometimes we underestimate, um, particularly in minority communities and in my community, the African-American community, is that there's a, a true historical context around um, a fear and a distrust of the medical system that is real. And we talk about the history as though it happened millions of years ago when for some of us, that history happened to our grandparents who we knew and loved and they were in our lives. And so it, it actually isn't something that went away and your ongoing experiences with the, the systemic racism that continues to exist in the medical system means that you're not necessarily going to trust the new vaccine that just came out. You're not gonna trust a vaccine that appears to change every year because you are gonna have suspicions that are grounded in some reality that at times institutions and the government and others have tested on people who look like you and that this could be another time when they're testing on you. And I think that's something that we have to be very honest with ourselves about as we're having conversations about hesitancy and why some folks may be um, hesitant. And then the last thing that I'll, I'll mention um, that I hadn't put in the other part that we might wanna talk out later is this idea about having a vaccine supportive team um, so that if, if you don't appreciate that everyone in your practice um, may not necessarily be as pro-vaccine as you are, um, or they may have their own fears and concerns and you don't help, help educate the others in your practice, you may find yourself working against yourself. And so this idea about having a practice supportive team, maybe even a champion in your practice, um, is super important. Um, and so I'm more than happy to answer questions about any of these things in the Q&A, or if there's something else that comes up, I'm glad to talk about that too. Thank you very much, Dr. Savoy. That was great. A lot of good uh, ideas to for the fellows to think about if they're covering the practice of medicine, any of you business reporters, for example.
Uh, but now let's turn this over to Seth Manukin, who is going to talk about his book, The Panic Virus, and also um, talk about kind of science writing and objectivity in general and, and how those can sometimes conflict. I'm going to tell you very briefly uh, about how I got into this topic. Um, so when my wife and I were expecting our first child uh, about 11 years ago, um, I was uh, surprised when parents um, in my peer group kept asking me what I planned to do about vaccines. Uh, that seemed like a ridiculous question. Um, and I realized that um, I had certain biases, including that people that I knew um, made their decisions based on science and, uh, and rational decision making. Um, and that in fact, a lot of my friends, including people who are journalists, uh, scientists, doctors, lawyers, um, were making decisions about this very basic health issue, one of the most important things that they're gonna do for their children in the early years of their lives, um, based on emotion and fear. Uh, and so I started to look into that, um, actually before our first child was born, and so then went through all of this uh, as my wife was pregnant um, and as we had our first child. Um, so that's my, a little bit of my background. Um, I'm going to talk about, let's see here. No, nope, it's not. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the roots of today's vaccine controversies. Uh, Walt talked a little bit about that Leah Thompson report with the DTaP vaccine. Um, it's, you can, you can find that on YouTube. It's really one of the most horrible pieces of television reporting uh, I've seen is also notable in that the reporter uh, not only refused to acknowledge that she might have made any mistakes at the time, but to this day uh, insists that there was nothing wrong with that. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about uh, is the FDA Modernization Act of 1997. Um, this was uh, really the introduction of the debate about thimerosal. Uh, which is a preservative um, that was widely used in vaccines, is now not as widely used in vaccines, but contains some mercury. Um, and the FDA Modernization Act of 1997 uh, mandated a federal report on all mercury and food and drugs within two years. Um, despite that, uh, the public health community and the medical community did not look into and put together a report about how much thimerosal uh, and therefore mercury was in vaccines um, and didn't think about how they were going to address that until literally the July 4th weekend in 1999, several days before they uh, had to make an announcement. Um, and so what happened at the end of some very contentious discussions, uh, it's, I can't remember, but it's possible that Walt might have been privy to some of those or part of some of those. Is that true, Walt? No, yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, um, but what happened at the end of that was that the CDC released a statement that said, um, further, there are no data or evidence of any harm caused by the level of exposure that some children may have encountered in following the existing immunization schedule. Um, and that is an example of a statement that is scientifically true, uh, but that a lot of people in the media and certainly in the public uh, did not understand. So a phrase like no data or evidence of harm um, sounds to a lot of non-scientists as if that's only because that data hasn't been found yet, uh, but it will be found. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a statement that uh, they tried to um, speak English a little bit more, uh, although they also did not uh, um, uh, reassure people. Um, they said parents should not worry about the safety of vaccines. The current levels of thimerosal will not hurt children, but reducing those levels will make safe vaccines even safer. Um, and the reaction of a lot of people understandably to that was that when they were told that something that they were giving to their infants was safe, they did not think that was on a sliding scale uh, of safe, safer, safest. They assumed safe meant safe. Um, and so what the AAP was trying to say was that essentially vaccines with thimerosal are safe. Uh, we're gonna remove thimerosal um, more because of a public relations issue uh, than of any evidence, but that should reassure people it largely did the opposite. Um, another thing that's important to remember moving forward is that 
uh, thimerosal now has been removed from almost all pediatric vaccines. The exception is some formulations of the seasonal flu vaccine. Um, uh, but despite the fact that thimerosal is largely gone, this continues to be an issue, and I suspect uh, will continue to be an issue going forward. In fact, there was a paper that I think came out last week um, in science from UCSF uh, that dealt with thimerosal and, and dealt with it partially. Uh, one part of the paper was about thimerosal and, and flu vaccines. Um, so the other big part of the vaccine controversy uh, that we've dealt with over the last couple of decades um, is related to the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Um, and that can be tied back to this person, uh, a British gastroenterologist named Andrew Wakefield. Um, and uh, in 1998, uh, he published a paper in The Lancet um, titled Iliolymphoid Nodular Hyperplasia, Nonspecific Colitis and Pervasive Developmental Disorder in Children. Um, and that paper had gone through uh, a lot of, there were a lot of problems with that paper even before publication. I'm not sure if you can see that on the slide, but that's why uh, stamped up in the upper left corner, it says early report, um, which was essentially a, a, a new uh, heading that they, they, they sort of created for this paper um, to show that uh, this was even sort of more preliminary than preliminary data. Um, the paper itself was awful, uh, but also was somewhat measured um, in its conclusions, but essentially what it was positing was that uh, it was possible that um, the measles component of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine uh, caused gut disorders in children, uh, and that in turn caused autism. Um, that was the sort of general hypothesis of the paper. Uh, the coverage of that um, was along these lines. Uh, the Daily Mail banned three-in-one jab, three-in-one being measles, mumps, rubella, um, urged doctors after new fears. The Independent, doctors link autism to MMR vaccination. Uh, the Guardian, um, I can say I believe 100% it is the bowel that has caused the autism. This was a quote from a parent. Mrs. Prosser believes the MMR vaccination set off the bowel disease, which in turn caused Ryan's autism. Um, so right there, we see uh, three um, very problematic headlines, uh, even just based on the paper. First of all, it was not doctors that were urging to ban the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Um, uh, it was one doctor, Andrew Wakefield, and it was not even in the paper that that was urged. It was in this very, very bizarre press conference uh, where he got up and sort of went off script to the point that the dean of his medical school took off his shoe and started banging it on the table in a sort of Khrushchev moment, um, trying to get him uh, um, to stop talking. Uh, um, the independent, um, again, doctors link autism to MMR vaccine. There was absolutely no link uh, in the paper uh, that was shown. Um, that gets back to what uh, Walt was talking about, about um, the fact that one thing follows another does not mean that it causes uh, that thing. Um, and the Guardian story, again, here what we're doing is taking anecdotes uh, and presenting them in a way uh, uh, that a reader could interpret them as being true. So it really doesn't matter what Mrs. Prosser believes um, because she's not a doctor and not a scientist and uh, individuals believe all sorts of things uh, that we should make decisions about. Now, in the years after uh, this paper came out, we learned a lot about, uh, about Andrew Wakefield, including that he had taken out a patent for a single dose measles vaccine just before that paper was published, meaning he had taken out a patent for a vaccine that you could use to replace the MMR vaccine if people believe that that was unsafe. Um, he received funding from and was working with lawyer, a lawyer who was actively seeking clients interested in suing vaccine manufacturers. That was not disclosed. Um, the children in his study, and this, I should have mentioned, this was a 12 child case study. This was not, um, this was not a large study by any stretch of the imagination. We have lost Seth. Um, let's just give him a second to, I will send him an email. Let's see if he can get back on the call. Um, but until he does, um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Orenstein?
or Dr. Savoy. We'll, we'll do some questions right now until Seth gets back with us. I have a question for Dr. Savoy. Sure, go ahead, Hannah. Um, hi, my name is Hannah. I'm with CrossCut uh, in Seattle. Thank you so much. Um, I, so I, I recognize that when you're sharing information about the types of vaccine hesitancy we're seeing with um, the possible coronavirus vaccine, that you're, you're referencing surveys that are being done about how people feel now. Um, but I'm wondering how you're feeling preparing to give a vaccine that we don't have yet for people and where, what types of information you're monitoring in the social space about how people are feeling right now. Um, are you talking with your colleagues about what they're seeing? What, what is that like? So the coronavirus vaccine is an interesting thing. So I've had people telling me that they were not going to get that vaccine that hurts people since March, which I find fascinating because I was like, there is no vaccine that's hurting anyone. It doesn't even fully exist yet. Like, I don't, where is that coming from? Um, the answer was Facebook. So I was like, interesting. Can you send me the Facebook post? I just would like to see it. Um, and so there's been people actively campaigning against the vaccine um, literally since we first mentioned that there might at some point be a vaccine. Um, and so I've, ha I've had those conversations with people in the office and I've heard of other people who are having the conversation too. I'll be honest, it's not coming up as much as you might think it would yet. And I say that because most of the people who um, are coming in, so I'm, I practice in Philadelphia, most of the people who are coming into our offices now, are, we're just now past our surge of COVID. And so in the beginning, people were so worried about getting sick and how to not get sick that most of our conversation was focused on how to not get sick right now and not so much worried about a vaccine. It's only in the last month or so as we've been starting to get back on board with doing routine care that people have been asking about it, particularly as we've been hearing more conversations about, well, what do we do when flu season comes? Because I start my flu conversations in the summer because it's just easier if I pitch the first half when I tell you when I see you again in the fall, we're gonna be doing that flu vaccine. And so we've been having some of those conversations already. What I mostly am hearing from people is that um, they're absolutely convinced that we're not ready, that we don't have a vaccine that's safe yet, that we have no way of knowing because we couldn't have possibly tested it because we didn't even know it existed before December. So how could you tell me that you know it's safe? Um, and that's their biggest concerns. Um, part of what I have the ability to be able to share a little bit different maybe than some folks is that um, I did do a lot of work um, around the CDC and around vaccines before, and I, I know that while they didn't have this specific vaccine available before, they've had cousins of this vaccine that they've been working on ever since MERS and back before. So they've been thinking about these types of vaccines for a while, and there's technology about how to um, speed up the way you make vaccines compared to the, way, the old way we used to make vaccines. So the newer ways that we make vaccines now don't have to take quite as long as some of the older ones do. And if you're building off of a cousin, it's not as hard as having to build totally de novo from scratch. And so sometimes I can explain that when they ask me, well, how do you feel about it? My answer is I have no idea yet. I haven't seen the data. So when somebody shows me the research that they've done and what they've found so far, then we can have a conversation about it. But to talk about it now, I think is incredibly premature because most of the things that I've seen so far have said that it appears to be and it seems to be, and I don't get excited about early data. I like to see what's gonna happen a little bit later. And so closer to when we get to the part where the FDA is actually reviewing is when I would be paying a lot more attention to what that information looks like and figuring out how to communicate that with, with patients. But I would tell them right now to hold off on being too excitable in either direction. Like, why are you so worked up about something that isn't even on the table yet? Um, let's not jump to conclusion about it yet. Thank you so much. Um, so we have, we have Seth, Seth is back with us. So uh, Seth, before we get back to you, uh, David Lim of Politico put one, one question in the chat um, for Dr. Orenstein or Dr. Savoy, I guess. What does the flu vaccine rollout look like this year? Do you anticipate starting flu vaccines earlier than normal? I'm not aware personally of how much will be there. They normally roll out August or September. I would strongly recommend that people get them as soon as they can. Um, and certainly I'm not aware of anything that would inhibit production of this coming uh, season's influenza vaccine. But I think the concerns are several fold. One, having two epidemics occurring at the same time and potentially the uh, complication of, of, of uh, COVID-19 by a, a of infection following influenza, we really have some uh, lung compromise a lot. So I very strongly recommend when vaccines become available for influenza that people get them. Okay. Well, Seth, welcome back. We had a nice um, seven or eight minutes without you, but uh, let's go back to your 
Go back to your slideshow. Uh, yes, okay. Finally, uh, some of the data uh, appeared to have been fabricated um, and the results seem to have been changed after the fact. Um, these are some of the reasons that ultimately, although it took a while, uh, the paper was retracted. Um, Wakefield also ended up losing his medical license, not just for this paper, but for at one point uh, at his son's birthday party, taking blood from the other children there for an experiment he was doing, uh, which as the parent of a child, I can only say worst birthday party ever. Um, so uh, what I think is important to point out about that study and about the press coverage of it is that the Lancet study did not say uh, most of the things that the news coverage claimed it had said. So in the Lancet study, what it actually said was, we did not prove an association between the MMR vaccine and the syndrome described. If there is a causal link, a rising incidence might be anticipated after the introduction of this vaccine in the UK in 1998. Published evidence is inadequate to show whether there is a change in incidence or a link with the MMR vaccine. Um, so right off the bat, I think what you see is a really sharp divide between what was in the paper and what was in the media coverage of the paper. Um, also, apart from the duplicity, apart from the fact that he was uh, receiving money from someone who was suing vaccine manufacturers, apart from its patent, there were also very easily identifiable problems with this study. Um, so first of all, the new syndrome that he claimed to have discovered uh, was well-documented, this gut syndrome, uh, and was nonspecific to patients with autism. Um, autism, obviously, was a well-known condition before the MMR vaccine was introduced. Uh, and the majority of the cases that he cited, so even in his paper, the behavioral problems that he was describing preceded the bowel problems. Um, and millions, hundreds of millions of children had received the measles vaccine, and there had been no evidence of an epidemic of chronic bowel uh, disease or behavioral problems. Um, so these were things also, in addition to what was in the paper itself, it would not have taken a very close reading of the paper to see why there were so many problems with this right off the bat. Um, uh, and finally, as I mentioned before, is an extremely limited case series. Now, I wanna talk very briefly about why I think coverage of uh, that paper and a lot of coverage of scientific studies, especially controversial ones, um, are not just bad, but irresponsible. Um, and so I'm gonna talk briefly about a 2007 University of Michigan study this is one of many, many studies. Um, in fact, these studies have only increased in the last uh, five to 10 years um, and have become a much bigger topic of interest for people uh, as the political landscape has shifted towards um, politicians making demonstrably false statements and uh, reporters trying to figure out how to responsibly cover that. Um, this study at the University of Michigan happened to be about vaccines, but that actually is not the important part of this. Um, so in the study, volunteers were given a list of 20 statements. Uh, half of them were identified as true and half as false. So for an example, they would be told the side effects of the flu vaccine are worse than the flu, false. Um, when they were quizzed, and these were graduate students at the University of Michigan, uh, so fairly well-educated people. Um, when they were quizzed several minutes later, they had a very good recall of what was a fact and what was a myth. So what was true and what was false. But that decreased incredibly rapidly over time. Um, and because at the outset, the volunteers had been told that the information on this true-false sheet was coming from a reputable source, what ended up happening was they began to assume that all of the statements were likely true. Um, and I think that really crystallizes the problem in reporting inaccurate things, even if then what you do is say that they're inaccurate. Um, so saying something like a doctor claimed that the MMR vaccine caused autism, research has shown that's not true. What reporters, what we in the media need to be aware of is that a significant percentage of people are going to come away from that story believing that that is true. Um, that's not only because of this phenomenon, but it's also because it's much easier to scare people than to unscare people. Um, this is something Cass Sunstein has talked about. Um, uh, discussions of low probability risks tend to heighten public concern, even if those discussions consist largely of reassurance. 
Um, and uh, there's a striking asymmetry between increasing fear and decreasing it. Um, a vivid incidents or worst case scenario can produce high levels of fear, but efforts of reassurance are far less likely to work. I think that's again what we saw in that Leah Thompson report from the 80s. Um, one final challenge, not one final challenge, the one final challenge I'm gonna talk about now um, in covering stories like this is that as reporters, what we're doing is looking for narratives. People respond to narratives. Um, that's how you can draw people into stories. Um, uh, and it's very tempting to use people who are willing to offer this, um, themselves up as experts, as being experts. Um, we saw this uh, in the vaccine autism controversy um, with Jenny McCarthy, who wrote uh, a series of books um, about her belief that uh, her son's autism, it's unclear if he has autism, um, was caused by vaccines. Um, and uh, she became a huge uh, media sensation, um, appeared multiple times on Oprah. Um, uh, and uh, what, what Jenny McCarthy said uh, and what Oprah reinforced was that uh, what she was saying was true because she was a mother. Um, and mothers know. This was around the same time that Oprah was also promoting the promise, um, uh, essentially that if you believe something, you can force it into being true, um, which is easier when you're a billionaire uh, than when you're not. Um, but this is, I think, an illustration of why someone like Jenny McCarthy was so appealing. Um, because here we have Harvey Feinberg uh, um, on Meet the Press um, saying, we now have a growing body of evidence that while imperfect, it's altogether convincing and all reaching the same conclusion, even though they vary in their methods and their approaches. And that conclusion was that there was no association between the receipt of vaccines containing thimerosal and the development of autism. Um, that is uh, not a real attention grabber, um, as opposed to Jenny McCarthy, who said, um, I believe that parents' anecdotal information is science-based information. Um, I speak to thousands of moms every weekend, and they're all standing up and saying the same thing. This is science-based information. Parents' anecdotal is science-based information. Um, uh, and the crucial thing that she said there is this anecdote of he had a fever, he stopped speaking, and he became autistic. Um, I want to, uh, um, I'm skipping a, some slides. I want to end on, on one point, which is that um, I think for people who uh, um, are um, pro-science, which is different from pro-vaccine, but are in favor of following the evidence, um, sometimes there can be a temptation uh, to go in the opposite direction and to sort of be an advocate. And I think that's actually just as dangerous as not presenting information in a way uh, that is accurate. Um, just a couple examples of this, um, and this happened uh, a while back, a couple of years ago, when there were large whooping cough outbreaks, um, there were a number of stories uh, um, insinuating that the anti-vaccine movement was the cause of these whooping cough outbreaks. Um, uh, here's one by Steven Salzberg. Um, here's one in the New Republic. Um, and the reality is that that actually is not at all true. Um, the rise in whooping cough cases was uh, it is in a way related to uh, the anti-vaccine movement, but is related more to the fact that after the uh, um, change of the pertussis vaccine um, from a whole cell to an acellular vaccine, uh, um, immunity started to wane. And so the outbreaks that we've been seeing have been in large part fueled by waning immunity um, on the part of adults and not on children not getting vaccinated. Children have some effect on that, but, but these types of stories are not true. Um, and I think the risk there is that uh, what we should be striving to do as journalists is not presenting things in an, on the one hand, on the other hand, framework when there aren't two hands. Um, and what this does is it essentially muddies the water and turns it back into a, uh, I say this, you say this, who knows what's right, let's throw up our hands and go with our instincts. Um, so that's my truncated version. I apologize again for my computer shutting down, um, but there you go. Question from Kira. Um, uh, is there any clinical testing ongoing of COVID vaccine and flu vaccine taken together? This is a follow-up to the, the flu vac vaccination schedules question. 
I, I'm not aware of the protocols that I have seen, and perhaps Dr. Savoy or, or, or would know, have don't have simultaneous because they're doing the trials now, even before we have influenza vaccines available. Uh, but I, I, there may be in the future simultaneous, but at the moment, the trials that are ongoing are, are just with the COVID vaccine. Although we do have, I got my flu vaccine yesterday. So they are now, I think as of this weekend, they're available. Lisa Krieger of the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, Dr. Savoy touched on this. There's a perception that the rush to create and license a vaccine is politically influenced. Can you address that? Is, will there be political pressure from the current administration? Um, is that a reasonable concern? I guess, uh, I mean, I'll throw that open to anybody, but I think Dr. Orenstein, you might have some thoughts on that, but uh, others chime in as well. Well, I think that the importance is to avoid that. And that's why it's very important that the, record, the licensing be done in a process that people can learn about it. I think the one thing that would be helpful, I don't know if this is planned, is the FDA has a program, uh, committee called Vaccines and Related Biologics uh, Technical Advisory Committee or Verb Pack. And it would be nice to hear those results before licensure. I think the, the fact that safety will, is a very big component of it is a good thing. And being done through the NIH, a lot of these data have to be made available publicly. So I think that's important. But we have to overcome that because there is real concern about political interference. And that would be a, a disaster in my opinion if in fact uh, there are influences that avoid the way we normally look at the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. Okay, let's, uh, so I wanna work in as many questions as possible. I'm gonna to go to some, to some uh, audio or visual questions. Uh, Jillian first, um, so for each, for if, when I turn the microphone over to you, just um, try to keep the questions fairly targeted so we can get through a bunch in the next 20, 25 minutes, but also tell the um, speakers uh, what news or outlet you represent. Hi, um, thank you all for, for talking to us. This is really great. I'm Jillian Mooney. I'm the breaking news editor at Healthline. Um, I had a question. I just saw the headline today about Russia saying they're going to start vaccinating. Or I believe they said they're going to start vaccinating in October. Um, what kind of issues could that bring up if another country, especially Russia, starts to vaccinate their population? What are you looking for in whatever data they might release from that? Um, yeah. I think what we've been looking for is, do they have an impact on COVID incidents? Are there groups that appear to be better protected than other people? Uh, are they getting uh, community protection as well as individual protection. Are they getting individual protection? And then a whole range of safety issues uh, is, uh, uh, are they, do they have a system in place that will monitor adverse events? Do they have a system in place, for example, that has background rates of similar clinical syndrome so they can tell whether the incidence of the adverse event is higher in the vaccinees versus the non-vaccinees and because that's going to be another major issue and can we trust the data that'll be uh, uh, that'll be critical I think it's also going to matter whether um, in their tracking someone is looking at whether or not the person who had who has gotten the vaccine also had been infected with COVID before um, because we're finding that there are a lot of what seems like post COVID syndromes where people who had no medical issues have gotten sick and then have continued to have ongoing um, medical problems, even though they're not still positive. So they may not still be um, infectious to other people, but they're still not back to their, their normal baseline. And so I think you're going to have to split out, which is gonna be interesting here because we've had so many people infected, but you're gonna to have to be able to split out who actually had the, the infection and then got vaccinated. And then what's really a side effect versus ongoing COVID issues versus who actually had no infection and now they're getting the vaccine and you're seeing that they're having a protection and something that's different on the other side. And, and Julia, I mean, 
one other thing. Uh, yeah, one other thing uh, um, is that I think related to the last question, absolutely we should be worried about the politicization of a vaccine. I mean, um, Trump has uh, essentially said outright that this is something that he wants to do before the election. And I think there should be a lot of concern, um, especially given uh, some public health officials' um, uh, willingness, apparent willingness, to not contradict him um, in situations when possibly they should. Uh, but I think also Russia has shown a very clear desire to influence the US elections. I think the fact that they have said that that would be occurring in October is not uh, coincidental. And so my concern about coverage of that would be that um, uh, it, the coverage is rushed um, and once a story is out there, it can be very hard to take it back. Um, and so I, I think it, it would serve everyone to be um, pretty skeptical of anything that we're learning in October, um, uh, especially from someplace like Russia. Okay, let's uh, turn it over to uh, Juliet Beverly. Hi, I'm Juliet Beverly from brainfacts.org um, in Washington, D.C. Um, I wanted to know what is the the education plan for updating doctors and public health officials about the cultural context behind a lot of the um, vaccine hesitancy, especially in the African American community. So I can't speak for all physicians because I'm not sure that um, I'm I'm not sure of a specific program that necessarily targets all physicians as a large group. Although there may be something that exists, I can speak. Um, specifically for family physicians, because I know what, what work is being done in that space. Um, so for example, um, as we, so when this, we tend, to rec we tend to recommend what the CDC recommends, because by and large, their evidence-based approaches align with what we think about as family physicians. Um, but we still have a group that actually reviews every recommendation that comes out and decides whether or not that's appropriate for a family physician to recommend or not recommend in their practice. Um, part of that group includes um, we have a Center for Diversity and Equity, and we have a subcommittee on health equity whose job it is to look at all of our policies and make sure that as we're putting them out, that we've been thoughtful about that the evidence actually supports whatever it is you're saying in the community. So were there even people in the study who look like the people who are asking you questions? So things like that. So looking for the background stuff that sort of leads into you making the recommendation in the first place. But then on the other side, there's a lot of work being done around how to have a conversation with patients and to be mindful and respectful and understand that, like, like I was saying before, historic, historical context isn't as historical as everyone always makes it out to be. That for some people, this is an ongoing thing. It's not a, it happened a long time ago and now I'm suffering and effective. It's something that is continuing for them in real time and being able to have that conversation and help people to understand that side is something that I've seen our academy working on through the center and specifically in a lot of CME, so continuing medical education work ensuring that as people are doing presentations about topics, they're including those topics and how you have that conversation in, not unlike they're doing with shared decision-making as a whole, because that's not something that, for example, when I was in medical school, we didn't necessarily learn about shared decision-making as a style of a way to teach. We didn't talk about that way of communicating with patients. I think they modeled it to some extent, but it really wasn't explicitly called that. That happened after I got out of medical school. And nowadays we teach it in medical school from the beginning as the way that you're working with patients. And I think that they're incorporating a lot of it in those lectures as well. And there are groups like the Infectious Disease Society of America that already have a weekly webinar reaching out to clinicians to talk about where we are at this point. And there are other groups as well, other physicians groups, such as American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Physicians, College of Physicians uh, American Academy of Family Physicians, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and many others. Uh, I think it's also important to realize that all of these groups have liaison representatives on the advisory committee on immunization practices. So not only can they get uh, information out in terms of what the ACIP is considering, but they also can participate and influence some of the policies that the ACIP is determining. And CDC often at least when I was at CDC and what I'm seeing now, develops materials that are for providers, materials for uh, patients or families or what have you, uh, 
And if you go on, on, the, on the CDC website, you can see even now with vaccines in general that you'll see uh, materials geared to different types of audiences. And I think those materials are extremely helpful. Hey there, Sarah Klein from Livestrong.com. Uh, Dr. Savoy, you mentioned you have patients who will get every other vaccine but really fight you on the flu shot in particular. Are they primarily concerned with having a reaction afterward or are you hearing about other concerns from them about flu particularly? Um, so the number one thing that I hear is you get the flu from the flu vaccine and I don't want to get sick. Um, the number two thing that I hear is I never get the flu so I don't need the shot. Um, and so they just don't feel like that's something that they get, that they don't get sick, they never have a problem. So if I get that shot, I'm gonna get sick and I don't get sick, so why would I take the shot? Um, are the two most common things, um, that at least in my office, that's what I hear. Hi, uh, yeah, Leslie McClurg from KQED, we're the NPR affiliate here in San Francisco. And as Dr. Ornstein, you put that graph of Kaiser, um, Northern California, you know, Santa Rosa Marin is primarily a lot of white or wealthier people and they're anti-vaxxers because of, uh, generally because of the natural anti-pharma, anti-government movement. I'm wondering, Dr. Savoy, if you could touch on why, what are you hearing from people of color in your office? What are their hesitancies? What do they name as the reasons that they don't want to get the, the vaccines? Um, so when I listen to people, so I'll talk about the COVID one because I think that's really apropos. The other place that I hear this sometimes from them is an HPV vaccine. So in vaccines where there is a very large conversation happening on social media about how the vaccine was made very fast or the vaccine seems to be being tested so that we don't think that it actually is a good one. It's just being tested. And so while they're being tested, they're going to push it into poor people. Um, and by poor people, they'll incorporate themselves in that group. So they'll say they're testing it on poor people. And so I'm poor and I'm black. So of course, they're going to try to give the vaccine to me. And then they'll bring back evidence of, see, as soon as they decided to start talking about the COVID vaccine, they immediately said they were going to go to quote unquote Africa and test it and dump lots of money into testing it in Africa. And that was further proof of the fact that they're just using this as a way to test on people. And therefore, why would I want to participate in that and potentially be harmed by something that's not going to actually save me or help me? Um, many of them fully appreciate the fact that it does seem like COVID happens more often in African Americans. Um, it does seem like it happens more in, in communities of color. They also think that that's not just because of, it's not necessarily because of their race, it's because of the other socioeconomic conditions that are causing them trouble. So they'll say to you, well, I didn't get to go home and stay home for three months and try to be safe. I had to still go to work every day. So of course I got sick. I had to ride the subway every day to go to work to still have exposures and contacts. And I didn't have the money to go buy new masks and new everything. You know, I didn't have that, that resource. And so what I'm finding is that many of them are coming back to the idea that things that I can't necessarily tell them are entirely wrong because quite honestly, it, watching it from the outside, there are some things that happen that sometimes seem a little suspect, right? And so just watching the way it gets reported versus what's actually happening, I'm never really sure what the full truth is, but it, it makes sense why someone might sit at home and think to themselves, maybe that's not the thing I wanna do. So I'm gonna wait on that, let some other people get it, see what happens and then figure out if that's a safe thing for me to do or not. And so I think that's, that's where I'm hearing a lot of pushback with that specific vaccine, even though it hasn't even come out yet. Andrew, let's go to Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew Dunn. I'm the healthcare reporter at Business Insider. Um, I was wondering, mainly for Walt, um, how legitimate of a concern in your mind is the idea of sort of these long-term unknowns around a vaccine, uh, specifically on long-term safety follow-up of people with sort of this condensed clinical trial timeline and, and also durability of protection where we, we just won't know until the data is there. Um, Especially, can you compare that to how vaccines are typically tested and developed? Do you normally have data over multiple years from some of the early safety studies? And, and is, is that a real concern as far as a legitimate reason to not take a vaccine? To me, when you have more than a thousand people dying a day, to wait to see five years worth of data on safety is a very difficult issue. What I think is critical is to put in place post-use monitoring systems, such as I explained with the vaccine safety data link, to look at long-term safety over time uh, with people. But you have to balance what the urgent is. And as I said, if you're getting a thousand people dying, you are not going to be able to wait, or you don't want to wait, uh, three or four years before having the vaccine available. The issue I think is also important that um, 
most trials that I'm aware of don't have long-term follow-up prior to the licensure. Um, a, a year, a couple of years is, is maybe most. Here we have uh, uh, an urgency, and I think people need to be informed about what we know and what we don't know about it. And But we are doing legitimate phase three trials, which are traditional trials that are done for all vaccines. And again, the FDA will have to look at that and then uh, presumably the ACIP will have to uh, evaluate that with the input of many people. The other advantage of the ACIP is that their meetings are open and people can tune in, not just the media, but individual persons that are on the internet and they are scheduled. It's at www.cdc.gov slash ACIP and you can listen into these and there's even a, 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 a way people, public input can be solicited. So the ACIP does try to consider both professional and public input in its deliberations. Hi, I'm Corey from Oprah Magazine and OprahMag.com. Um, and I should say, only because we just saw a picture of Oprah with Jenny McCarthy, that for the past 15 years, our magazine has uh, been incredibly pro-vaccine and oh, really informative, you know, yeah. incredible experts like um, people we have today, here today. Anyway, quick question that flows from what Juliet had asked for Dr. Savoy. Um, in addition to doctors being, her question about doctors being trained in cultural competency to talk to their patients about vaccines and being knowledgeable of vaccine history and racism that was part of that, I'm wondering if there's been any movement or if there are groups of people that are trained separately from doctors to communicate with patients about vaccines and inform them, like we've seen with health navigators or breast cancer navigators who are separate from the doctor, having other people that the patients might be able to relate to and trust having these conversations specifically about vaccines with them. Um, so part of the team-based approach that I alluded to at the end when I was just sort of throwing out things that we could talk about, there, um, there are models of care that involve actually engaging your entire practice and being what, what I would call vaccine friendly. But the idea being that, um, for example, you don't want just the physician in the practice being the one that's giving your message. You actually want the entire practice to be giving the same message. So for example, you want everyone in the practice to have been vaccinated against flu vaccine if you're gonna be telling people to get the flu vaccine. And when people call on the phone for their appointment, you wanna be letting them know, hey, oh, by the way, it's flu season, so we're doing flu vaccines. And when they check in, you remind them that there's flu vaccines. And when their nurse or the MA goes in the room that they can answer questions reasonably for their level of sort of, for their level of training, be able to answer questions and bounce people back to you. The last thing that you need is to have gone through the whole process, you're all ready to go. And then the nurse goes in and says, I would never give that vaccine to anybody in my family because I think it's the most horrible thing ever. In which case you sort of unraveled sort of all the work that had been done. Um, the way that that training normally tends to happen, um, some of it happens through um, the CME equivalent for, for example, nurses. So they have nursing equivalent and lectures that happen on their side. Um, medical assistants don't necessarily, um, there isn't necessarily a vaccine navigator that's a position that exists in the world, but a lot of times people will choose a vaccine champion for their practice, which could be a nurse or could be anyone in the office um, that is just really interested in vaccines and they train them sort of internally. Um, one of the projects that we worked on with the Academy for, um, for the American Academy of Family Physicians was actually training the people to train other people so that in states you could actually connect people to doing internal training to train people how to be better at having that conversation and doing that work. Um, and so I do know that they have models that they've been able to show that have best practices or ways to sort of um, help, the, help the champion help other people, but then also identify ways of training. And then some of them are more vaccine specific. So for example, the um, National HPV Provider Round, National HPV Vaccination Roundtable um, which is through the CDC, um, but in partnership with, it's paid for by the CDC, but it was in partnership with the American Cancer Society. They have like entire toolkits around, for example, with HPV vaccine, how you can help the nurse or the MA, how you can have a health system be better at it, how you can have people have it. I find those toolkits really helpful because even though they wrote them for HPV, because that's what the grant was for, the concepts translate across vaccines. And so you could use that same information in many spaces. Um, hi, Sonny Salzman. I'm with ABC's uh, medical unit. Um, I'm curious, since, this, since we're talking about public perceptions of vaccine, I'd love to get, I mean, anyone's take on um, 
Operation Warp Speed. Um, and basically just what that term conveys if you've noticed that it's causing any problems or issues with perception of vaccine. I think the, the initially I thought it was a good term. I, in retrospect, it's a lot easier to be a historian than to make history. I think it has given people an impression that corners will be cut. And so it has raised concerns that we may not have really safe vaccines coming. And we need to, in our educational efforts, try to explain we're still requiring phase three trials, we're still requiring comprehensive protocols, we're still requiring that there be comprehensive looks at the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines in the people who participate in the trial. And none of, to my knowledge, none of those corners are being cut. But I think that um, it, it clearly with some people, it has raised concerns that these vaccines are going to get by with a far lower standard than other vaccines. Hi, this question is for Dr. Savoy. I'm Wade Gibbs with Scientific American. Uh, is it known what the cold chain requirements are going to be for or likely to be for a COVID vaccine? And given the inventory issues you were talking about earlier, um, how will storage needs you think complicate distribution through primary care doc doctors? So I'm not sure whether it's frozen, but the ones they're talking about are frozen versus refrigerated. Um, what I do know is that if you're a practice that tends to give vaccine, then you're going to be fine um, because you're going to have it available. What may be problematic is if we decided that we wanted, you know, every person in America to be offered this vaccine, no matter where they show up, you may have people who do not have, for example, the correct types of refrigerators and freezers or the appropriate monitoring systems in place to do that. So for example, if you have um, vaccines for children, you have no choice but to have that because that's part of the setup that goes into being allowed to be a provider for that sort of, um, for that program. If you're not, and so that you don't necessarily have people forcing you to be monitoring in that way, you may need for people to either gear up or know that part of the rollout may be having to help people be supported and having it available. I do know that in some communities where people have um, mostly um, smaller practices that can't always have sort of the setup to be able to deliver vaccines themselves. Many of them have partnered with pharmacies to figure out if there are ways that the pharmacy has the ability to store and then you're not necessarily having to hold the entire um, amount on hand that like you can sort of work with them in a way to do that differently or even deliver it at the pharmacy. So there may be other opportunities. I think it's gonna depend on, um, on the actual vaccine them themselves is what I would be looking for. Thank you. Okay, let's turn it over to Rachel. A quick question for Dr. Arnstein. Um, have, any, have any deaths been attributed to being caused by the flu vaccine? And if so, how many? Uh, I'm not aware. I mean, there's theoretically concerns such as anaphylaxis. I'm not aware specifically of, of, of deaths attributed to the actual vaccine. I could be wrong, but clearly there are are tens of thousands of deaths each year caused by influenza itself. An influenza vaccine is not our best vaccine. It's about 40 to 60 percent effective in a good year. And thus, we have a self-interest. If I get myself vaccinated for influenza, I not only should try and get myself vaccinated, but all my friends, colleagues, because I may be in the 40 to 60 percent that's not protected. And I can indirectly protect myself if I get all my friends vaccinated and colleagues and people who might expose me. Okay. Um, so we have a question here from Umer Irfan of Vox. This is for Dr. Savoy. The federal government has made several announcements of its purchases of COVID-19 vaccine supply lines and doses. Is there any comparable effort to lay the groundwork for administering the vaccine among clinics? particularly to deal with the cost and stockpiling issues that you mentioned? So I personally am not aware of what the plan is. I'm sure that somewhere someone's having a conversation. Um, if I were if I were gonna think about it, the most likely way is probably through the networks that already exist through things like vaccines for children, um, because you already have a, a sort of provider set of networks. I think it will depend on whether the government chooses to release it directly or whether it goes out through the pharmaceutical companies themselves. For example, with H1N1, um, when we had to get a lot of vaccine out to a lot of people very quickly, you had multiple ways as a practice to be able to access the vaccine, to be able to give it. Um, some of the hurdles that we would have to think about with, are things like who's going to pay for it. So for example, with H1N1, you did not actually have to purchase the vaccine in order to have it available in your practice to give it out. 
you delivered, they gave you the vaccine, you delivered it, but you didn't charge anyone for the vaccine. So I didn't charge you the X number of dollars for the actual vaccine itself, um, but I gave it to you because it was given to me. And then somebody somewhere, I guess, worked out the math. If we did something that way, it might look very different than if, you know, the vaccine costs $500 a dose and all of a sudden I have to pay the $500 a dose to have it available. I don't know that that's the right number. I have no idea what the number is, but you know, if there's something like that, there would be a much different um, barrier than if, if it's done in a different way. Um, so I have a question from Anjali. Uh, microphone to you, Anjali. Thank you. Uh, my question for Dr. Zafoy just got uh, addressed. So for Dr. Ornstein or Seth, just really quickly, when you're looking at these uh, publications and all the information and data that's coming out for these uh, COVID vaccines and other trials, um, to avoid any of the misinformation that we've seen in the past, what would you suggest uh, reporters look at? It's hard to say one thing because there's so much, there's, there are so many different types of information that are coming out so quickly. Um, I think in general, it's crucial to look at uh, things like sample size, um, the amount of people that, that the trial occurred on. Um, I think in these types of situations, it's important to look at uh, um, the backgrounds of the main authors. Um, there were some COVID studies that came out a couple months ago that uh, in very prominent publications that had to be retracted. Um, and a common thread was that there was one author in both of them that did not have uh, a big track record and they were using a data set that also um, was essentially unknown. Um, and so things like that are certainly red flags to look at. Um, in any scientific study, I think, uh, um, and, and this is why, th this is something I think is really important for people covering science generally, um, to find sources in that field that aren't working on that um, that you can go to and show them a preprint and say, uh, this seems pretty good to me, what do you think? Or something feels off about this, I can't put my finger on it. Um, do, do you see anything in this? Um, but I think in general, there's going to be a, um, uh, not, uh, among politicians certainly, but also among the scientific and medical community and the public, there's going to be a desire for good news. Um, and I think that uh, we all need to sort of be careful about letting that overwhelm um, or letting that blind us to what might be shortcomings or drawbacks in, in studies. A couple of questions about um, vaccine hesitancy among different subgroups. One of them is from Matthew Hudson, um, who, as I re recall, came through uh, Seth's or came through the MIT science writing program, he asked, there's evidence that well-educated well people are less likely than others to accept vaccines. Why is that? And, and um, uh, Anna Sussman asks, is gender a, vaccine, a gender a factor in vaccine hesitancy? So vaccine hesitancy by education, a vaccine hesitancy by gender. I mean, what, what, what did the data show on those two factors? I, guess. I think on the, uh, I'll take on the, the education side. Big concern is twofold. One, that natural is better. And so the concern is vaccines are artificial. A second issue is these diseases are almost gone. They don't perceive the need. Uh, and the third is issues of distrust in the pharmaceutical system, in the government, and the like. Those are the three main things that gear particularly toward the groups with, I call it, higher years of schooling, not necessarily higher education. And the uh, issue is, is really to, when I was director of the U.S. immunization program, my director of communications used to say, you need the right message delivered by the right messenger through the right communications channel. And uh, that we need to find people, these people trust and work with them in terms of showing them what the real information is and uh, trying to convince them. First of all, Matthew, you were clearly trained very well, uh, <laughs> although I can't take any credit for that. Um, uh, the, the vaccine hesitancy is a really interesting issue because um, usually uh, at this moment in history, what we see in the country is that um, trust in science is a very politicized issue with people 
uh, on the left tending to trust it more and people on the right being more skeptical. Um, you don't see that as much with vaccines and you don't see that a, a, on a political level. You don't see um, what are oftentimes uh, divisions among um, socioeconomic levels, education levels, all those things are sort of thrown out the window a little bit with vaccines. Um, I think specifically in relation to higher educated uh, and or wealthier people, um, you have a fair amount of nimbyism, um, but just on a personal level. Uh, um, and in fact, some of the big um, anti-vaccine doctors um, actively promote people who are concerned about vaccines, like Bob Sears in California, not sharing their concerns with their friends so that all of their friends' kids get vaccinated and then can protect their child that they don't want to get vaccinated because they're skeptical about it. Um, but what you do see is uh, a whole range of issues. You have um, libertarians, um, you have, uh, as Walt pointed out, and there's an eco component to this, a natural component to this. Um, I once asked a, a California epidemiologist how he predicted where there were going to be measles outbreaks, outbreaks, and he said he took a map of the state and he put a pin every place there was a Whole Foods and he drew a circle around it. Um, and I laughed as some of you are doing now, and he was not joking. Uh, um, you know, he said, we don't actually use that, but that is, that's, that is not a bad way to anticipate where there are going to be clusters of, um, of unvaccinated children. Um, so uh, I think you just have a lot of different social um, and political and, and personal currents. Um, you started to see this also with sort of the rise of helicopter parenting, um, which I think is also not coincidental. But uh, yeah, and one last thing I want to point out there, and I think this gets lost in a lot of vaccine coverage, is that um, uh, the norm is still overwhelmingly that parents vaccinate their kids, um, even parents who are, have some questions about it. Um, we have vaccine uptake rates of over 90% uh, for most vaccine preventable diseases in this country. Um, and the fact that that is left out of coverage, um, I think, is a problem because when the coverage implies that there are 20 or 30% of the population that's not vaccinating, it normalizes it in a way uh, and gives people sort of permission to not vaccinate. Whereas if people knew that, oh, actually nine or nine and a half out of 10 of my neighbors are vaccinating, um, there is, people are much more than likely to, uh, if they're sort of on the line to say, okay, I'll, I'll do this as opposed to not. Okay. Dr. Savar, you had a quick comment? The one thing I was just going to mention about the gender part, so I don't know that there's ever been a study about it, but I will tell you that both it personally and professionally, the rise of mommy groups on social media yeah. um, are actually really an important way that a lot of women get information about how they're going to care for their kid, how they're going to plan for their pregnancy, how they're managing their life. Um, and some of them can be um, very, very toxic to people who have an idea that goes counter to the rest of the group. Um, in the sense that they can be very cliquish. So this happens around conversations with breastfeeding. It happens around conversations around birth planning. It happens around birth control. Um, and immunizations comes up quite frequently. Um, and they can be very harsh. And so some of the times the messages are not things that are just posted blindly on Facebook. It's people who you trusted as a community telling you information and then almost shunning you if you don't do what the rest of the group is doing. Um, and so that it sometimes creates um, a space where it might look like for example, women are more anti-vax than men, but it's because women tend to bring the children to the doctor for the vaccine in the first place. So you're getting a warped perception based on something that's not necessarily one-to-one. -one. It's just more how it normally was happening previously. And they're the ones who are more likely to be in those groups because they're the ones that are often more likely providing the direct child care and so looking for support. And when they find their support, if their support structure is one of these spaces, then they may be more likely to be influenced by that space. Two more questions. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here um, that touch on the same issue. This is from Melissa of the LA Times. Um, is a community responsibility aspect of being vaccinated against COVID likely to work? The controversies over masks suggest maybe not. Um, and then also Mary Haynes of the Las Vegas Review Journal asks, what's your sense of what degree the public will want the COVID vaccine? Will fear of the disease offset fear of a vaccine? I know those are kind of combined, but big questions. Can you maybe each of the three of you give us a very tight, uh, your very tight thought about fear of the vaccine versus um, 
you know, fear of vaccinations or fear of the disease versus fear of vaccina vaccination and uh, the community responsibility aspect. Dr. Orenstein? I would think that the community responsibility is not a good driving force. People are more likely to get vaccines that protect them than protecting their community. We may need to sell that in terms of you can protect grandma and grandpa, things like that, but we need to, to work on that. I think the other, the other issue is, is that um, it, the, the uh, disease incidents, I think, would influence people, if, if, if particularly if you begin to see and know of people who are suffering from the disease. So I think that, Initially, I think we will have more demand than vaccine available. We're not going to get over 330 million doses the day after the first vaccine is licensed. But I think over time, there will be experiences which hopefully will, will help in, 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 in addressing some of the concerns that, of the people who will be hesitant. Okay. Uh, Dr. Savoy, any thoughts about you know, what will motivate the public? Um, if you had asked me this time last year if I thought asking people to do something really straightforward to make sure that we didn't all die, we would all say yes. I would have said yes. Clearly, I watched too many movies. So I thought that when the aliens came that we would all band together and fight the alien. And to me, COVID was the alien. So I am actually shocked that we have to fight with people about putting on a mask. So from my perspective, I'm not convinced that telling people getting a vaccine will save your neighbor will make any difference. I do think that telling them getting a vaccine may save their family member might matter. But I'm a little bit hesitant on that too because I see people going to visit grandma with no mask on after being at the party the night before and so clearly um, my understanding of our sense of community is much different than what it really is in America at the moment. Um, about the vaccine I'm actually a little um, less optimistic than Dr. Orenstein but only because um, I'm not convinced that if the disease gets, I think that more people will be willing to get the vaccine if the disease gets very bad over the winter, but I also think they'll be so afraid to come to the doctor's office where you need to get the vaccine that they may not get it either. And so I'm not 100% sure how that pans out into people actually getting it on the other side. Um, and so practically speaking, I think the demand may be there, but I'm not 100% sure people will actually actualize it because of sort of the other, the other fears of coming into the space and being around other people who might be sick. Okay, uh, Seth, any final thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think this really highlights what uh, incredibly unusual moment we're at in history because um, really, if you look back historically, there are almost no instances, with the exception of uh, a polio outbreak in Nigeria in the last couple of years, um, but there are almost no instances of diseases being endemic uh, in a society and uh, there being widespread opposition to uh, the, a vaccine for that disease. Um, generally, anti-vaccine movements gain traction when, as uh, I can't remember if uh, Dr. Savoy or, or Dr. Ornstein mentioned this, that when vaccines are a victim of their own success, when diseases pretty much disappear. And so the fact that I think by all polling accounts, by every metric, we are entering into a period where we will have a vaccine for what is obviously an incredibly dangerous and deadly disease that is absolutely destroying the economy of the country. And you're gonna have enormous percentages, significant portions of the population who are gonna refuse that. It, it, it just, it, it highlight, you know, I know so many things have changed in the last four years and it, it, it can be hard to wrap our heads around, but that is really, astounding. I mean, it, it's not something that has happened um, uh, with very few exceptions in, in history. Um, but I think there, we will definitely see uh, um, significant hesitancy around the vaccine. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the fact that you're, as, as Dr. Savoy said, that you're seeing people resistant to masks, even when people in their community are clearly getting sick after not wearing masks. Um, uh, you know, or you have someone like, like Louis Gohmert saying that masks gave him COVID. Uh, it just is, it's um, astounding. Um, one last point I want to make, just um, piggybacking on, on what Dr. Savoy said about fears potentially of going to the doctor's office is um, another vaccine related aspect of the COVID story is um, there's a lot of concern uh, in the pediatric community about 
outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases this winter because so many immunizations were missed over the last four and five and six months. Um, uh, so, um, you know, especially if you do start having uh, schools meeting in person and people have not caught up on uh, on their missed vaccinations, that could potentially be a big problem. And I think that that the backlog issue um, of appointments um, and the fear of going to the doctor's office uh, is something that I think is also, uh, as Dr. Swiss said, really going to impact uptake of the COVID vaccine, even in communities and, and even among people who would be inclined to take it. 